All right, so this is chapter 16. It's all about the control of gene expression. Um, I, did, I did take this actually from Kim Foglia. She is a, a former AP biology teacher. She actually is now passed. Um, but her site is still up. It's called explorebiology.com. Um, and it was so, it was, her, her material was so solid that they're actually still keeping the site up, um, even though she's passed and keeping it going. So um, these are just kind of examples. And she did a good job as, as far as this, that, that idea of this methylation. Um, and I might come back to this picture to show you. This is, again, this is these, these histones. And notice how the way that the DNA is wrapped around. So basically this idea is that DNA, okay, remember DNA is a very long stretch. If you took DNA, um, I've, I've heard some estimates that you could take, uh, you take the, 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 the DNA of, of um, you and the 7 billion people that we have on the earth, or 6.9 billion people, and um, take all the DNA from each of those people. You can stretch it from like here to, to, to Pluto. A lot of DNA, a lot. I mean, and 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 the the time it, okay, just just in kind of your thought process, the time it's going to take for you to get from here to Mars, which is what two planets, one planet away. Mars, one, one planet away, right? Yeah. So I, I'm not a space person. So, anyways, the time it takes you to get from from Earth to to Mars um, is like three months. Okay. So imagine how long it would take you to get from Earth to to Pluto. Uh, yeah, I've, like I've heard it's not a planet, it is a planet, I don't know. Uh, normal, no, no, I mean like, oh, what, the three-month thing? So the three-month thing is, is as fast as we can go right now, our rockets that we have currently. Yeah, so I was, I was, thought, I was thinking it was a year thing, but, um, but the last one I heard was three months, so. I could never be in a Anyways, so DNA is, so what I'm saying here, what I'm saying is DNA is really, really, really long. And your cells are not very big at all. Remember, you have to have a microscope to see cells. So you have to take this really long chunk of DNA and you have to make it into a very easily folded, compact form into the chromosomes, um, to, but also be able to easily unpack so you can read it and produce what proteins or make more DNA. Okay? So here's the question. Is that if you start off with a sperm and an egg and that sperm and egg become one cell, that one cell becomes two, two becomes four, eventually starts to specialize. Those are your stem cells. Those stem cells will eventually start to specialize as you develop. The question is, remember, specific genes will turn on and off. Your DNA, the DNA that you have in your cheek, the same DNA you have in your toe, the same DNA that you have in your ear, or whatever. Every single cell is exactly the same DNA. But your toe and your liver and your eyes do not do the same thing. All right, your eyes don't look like toes. <laughs> they look weird. They do. No, so weird. The reason why is because the genes will turn on and off. So the genes are there, but certain genes are turned on and certain genes are turned off. Okay, and that's how we specialize specific ideas. And so as the baby is developing, okay, so as this baby is developing from five weeks to fourteen to twenty weeks, this this baby. These specific cells, remember, these are all coming from one cell, right? So that's multiple cells there. You can already see the eyes, the hands. You're starting to see the intestinal tract. There's the backbone forming right there, the notochord, okay? Your brain is starting to develop, things like that. So as these things are being developed, these cells are specializing. Genes are being turned on. Genes are being turned off, okay? Remember, we, at the very end of Chapter 14, I talked about telomerase. That is a gene, that produces more telomeres, but that gene is eventually turned off, except for specific cells, right? Like your intestinal lining and those kind of things. So those, those, that specialization is because, not because you have different DNA in your eye, you have different DNA in your toe, it's just because that DNA is turned on and off in different locations. Um, and so it, it goes back to evolution. Remember the four big ideas. Remember we have genetics and evolution. So here's the breakdowns at lac operon. Again, this is what y'all did in that, um, in that, at that simulation. Um, here's that Tata box. This is that promoter sequence. This promoter sequence could be further on down the DNA. Okay. Um, but most of the time, the promoter sequence is right near the operator. And the promoter sequence is what the RNA, is, is, RNA polymerase is looking for to make, to code for the genes. Okay, and then we kind of already, again, it's, it's transcription and then translation and then forming the proteins themselves. But as, and this is what it's talking about in here, conformational change in the repressor protein. So as the more and more this lactose is being broken down, 
then it's going to change this repressor, and that repressor will eventually actually repress. It will stop the production of the, the laxi. Okay. Yes, the, amount, the more lactose available, the more <coughs> genes that will be read. Okay, because the more genes that are read, the more the lactose is going to be broken down. Okay, think back to that, that lac Z. When the very first simulation, it had the RNA polymerase, the RNA polymerase would go along and produce lac Z, the little purple things floating around. And the more, the, the, the more lactose that was come, it came down, the more lac Z that was produced. Okay, and so... So, it's, so as more of that lactose is being, is being broken down, less and less is, is available, the lac repressor, the repressor protein actually is formed, and that, that represses the reading by the RNA. Why does RNA need it, though? Why does RNA need what? The lactose. The lactose? Because that lactose is like a signal. Hey, we've got a lot of lactose. We need something to break that lactose down. Because the lactose in there can be used to, to generate, you know, to generate um, um, energy, to, to help do other functions, to, to um, do other cellular functions. It generates energy for the RNA to read it? No, it generates, it generates energy for the cell to function. Okay. The RNA reads it merely just because it has to read um, the DNA to break down the lactose, so then the lactose can be used as, a, uh, as an energy source. Okay. Why does the cell have lactose? It's that whole operation... Um, Sorry, it's that whole transduction pathway. So lactose itself is the signal. And the signal has a specific protein on the outside, that lac Y. And what cell does? The lac Y. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For the most part. I mean, for the most part, it's lac Y. But also remember, it's, 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 a, it's a mechanism. It's a feedback mechanism. So as there's more lactose... Then it, remember on the, the simulation, um, as there's more lactose, those those operators are going to be pulled. That lac I is going to be is going to be trapped with lactose, and so it allows the lac uh, Z to start breaking down the lactose. And so it's 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 not so much like a detection; it's more like a feedback mechanism. Because there's more lactose available, it causes the blocking of the operator, the lac I, and because there's a block in the operator, that allows for more lac Z to be produced. No, I mean you can see the lactose level. You can actually measure the amount of lactose available. Yeah. Um, you can actually control that, but it's it, it's it's more of a mechanism. It's kind of like the heater in your house. Mm -hmm. When it gets too cold, it kicks on, and when it gets to that certain temperature, it kicks off. It's just like when it gets too much lactose, the the lactose the lactose starts being regulated or it starts uh, being uh, transcribed, um, and then as lactose level goes down, the lac Z gets shut down and the lac I gets produced. So it's a it's a constant mechanism itself. All right, so here's a, another kind of picture of the self. Um, we're getting back to this allosteric regulator. What, what was allosteric meaning? <coughs> what did it do to the protein? Yeah, so it blocks it, but what is it also doing to the shape? Yeah, it's actually changing the shape. So remember, allosteric regulators are those, are those things that go into enzymes. Those inhibitors that go into enzymes actually change the shape of the enzyme. Okay? So... What it's saying here is, this, that, again, this is that idea that, that right here, if lactose is present, the repressor is inactive and the operator is on. So this is lactose. If lactose is present, it inactivates the, re the repressor and then forms the mRNA. But if lactose isn't present, present, this protein actually locks on right here. And that, if that locks on there, the RNA polymerase can't do its job. So this entire thing is called the lac operon. And if the lac... If the lac operon is on, it's producing. If the lac operon is off, it's not producing. Okay. And again, that's what you saw in the simulator itself. Do it. It will eventually release. It's just like it's just like on the simulator itself. Remember the, little, the yellow and blue little dots, lactose. Um, eventually, they were released because they're only they're only designed to last for so many days or for so long. It's uh, it's some kind of biochemical pathway. I don't know. Honestly. So the shape doesn't matter? The shape does matter. But when it does release, when, when, <clears throat> when this protein right here, this repressor, um, says, okay, you know, I'm not around anymore, 
it will release that lactose, and that will then change the shape back. So it wouldn't Because, it, again, remember allosteric inhibitors, um, when, they're, when they're present, they change the shape. And when they're not present, the shape goes back to its normal formation. This top of the protein? This top of the protein fits right there. And it was just like in the simulator where that little, it looked like a little spaceship would come down. Yeah. That's what the spaceship is. It's this thing right here. And that right there was the operator, that little, that little Lego block that stuck up. It changes the shape so that you can't that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay. So, whereas in eukaryotes, again, remember, it's, it's based on homeostasis. Um, primarily, this idea of growth and development and specialization. That's when that baby is developing, it's also going to turn large genes on and off when you're specializing, we're, we're becoming an eye cell or a toe cell or a liver cell. So here's the, that little breakdown I've shown y'all. Again, we've got things like, how's the DNA packed? Again, remember, DNA is very, very long. It's going to be packed. And it's, it's, it's been described as beads on a string. Okay, so y'all can kind of see those beads on a string right here, right? Beads, string, okay? So that beads on a string is because each of those beads is where histone is attaching. The nucleosome is the bead itself. So a histone is there, the DNA wraps itself around the, DNA, uh, around the histone, and then those histones are then all locked together. Okay? Um, Y'all remember that little wire wrap that I had with my extension cord, the orange thing? Right? That's basically what a histone is. So a histone is like a wire wrap, where you take that extension cord and you wrap it around there, okay? And you can just imagine if we had like a 600 foot cord, that wire wrap will only hold, say, 100 feet. And so we're going to need six histones, we're going to need six wire wraps to hold all that cord together. But if we continue to wrap and wrap the 100 feet and we get another wire wrap and wrap and wrap, and, and you're going to have a, a wire wrap, a little bit of cord, a wire wrap, a little bit of cord, a wire wrap, a little bit of cord. But if we wrap all those very, well, very tightly together and everything, we can very easily then put that into a box. Whereas if we take all 600 feet of cord, okay, and we then take that and put that all into a box, and we want a specific section of that cord, Let's say we know that there's a specific section that was, uh, was, was, needs to be repaired. We're going to have to go through the entire box and find that one repair. But if I take out those six sections of cord and I only unwrap the section I need, then all of a sudden my efficiency level goes way up. And that's what's going on with these histones. That because the histones only wrap up a certain section, and we're only going to say let's, we're going to read genes uh, 3 and 5, we're only going to wrap those histones that have the genes 3 and 5. We're not going to wrap anything else. And that's the difference between the heterochromatin and the euchromatin. These guys, right? There. These ones, right here, these heterochromatins, those heterochromatins are the places where they're wrapped up very, very tightly. The histones are very close together. These euchromatins, these light-colored ones, this is where the, the wrapping is undone. And those are the genes that are on. So the genes that are off are in the heterochromatin, whereas the genes that are on are in the loosely area. Okay, so the tight ones are in the heterochromatin, and those are off. Another idea is DNA methylization. Again, this is a part of the whole wrapping thing. Um, the, the best way you kind of read it is, let, let's say, for instance, you have a ribbon. The DNA is a ribbon, and you put a paper clip onto that ribbon, and you have a little bead. And that bead represents RNA polymerase. And you take that bead, and you slide it along the ribbon. If there's no paper clip, couldn't the bead go all the way across the ribbon? Yeah. But if I take a paper clip and I stick it down along the bead track, and the bead's going along, the bead's going along, and it hits that paper clip, can it go any further along the ribbon? No. That's what methylization is. It's adding an extra little piece onto that system, the cysteine, and that cysteine is basically being methylated, and so the RNA polymerase can't read it anymore. Okay. So that turns a gene off. But if we want to turn a gene on, we acetylate it. And so we add what's called an acetyl group, the acetyl group basically kind of binds it a little bit into where it doesn't wrap nearly as tight. And so we're looking at those little cord wraps. If I put, if I put some kind of large mechanism onto that cord, if I put some kind of like large, I don't know, some kind of large mass on the end of that cord, I can't wrap that cord nearly as tight as, as, I, as I normally could. And if I can't wrap that cord nearly as tight as I normally could, I'm not going to have to unwrap that entire cord to find that one piece. And so that's what an acetyl group does. And that acetyl group basically changes the, the shape of the histone and it makes it towards active and open towards inactive. Okay. Okay. Um, again, this is the initiation. It's a whole factor. It's a whole group of, people, of, of, of promoters. 
Now notice the promoters are going to be very nearby, but the enhancers are going to be further away. So enhancers are going to be very far away, but the promoter has to be very close to the coded region. That was like that, that um, remember on the simulation? The very first simulation, it had like the, the, was it green, the pink area, and then the longer yellow area? Mm -hmm. The pink area was the regular protein. That's where that transcription factor would attach. The enhancer sequence wasn't even on that, that uh, simulation, but it would have been further down. And so it, it basically controls which ones will, will, will activate and enhances the, uh, the transcription factor. Okay? Um, yeah. That's kind of a picture of talking about all this. Um, here's that whole complex. Okay? So this right here, this first section right here, that's that transcription factor. That's that Tata box. But then every single one of these other pieces are other parts of the transcription factor. And so it's what we call the transcription factor complex. And so it's a large unit that has to be formed, and then the DNA is starting to be read to form uh, mRNA. Wait, so what's the point of all that? So the point of all that is so that, that this RNA polymerase can continue to, to be read, to, can, can allow itself to do its job. If this doesn't form, see that little activator piece right there? Mm -hmm. If that activator piece does not, is not bent down, and the reason why it's bent down is because of all of this bonding right here, <coughs> if that doesn't bend itself, all the way down there, the RNA polymerase is not able to be read. So every single one of these pieces, the you know, piece A, piece B, E, F, all these ones, all have to be attached here to where all of these co-activators and activators are all attached, which then causes this activator to cause the RNA polymerase to move on. So it can read the DNA? Yeah. So it can read the DNA to form the mRNA. Uh, another one is, is post-transcriptional. How many exons do you leave in? Okay. Or how many introns do you leave in? Um, where, where is it that you're going to cut the exons out? Um, how are they going to be merged together? Those are all ways that we, can, we change what the protein is going to look like. Same thing as far as uh, number four is, is the degradation. How long is it going to last? Again, it could be for hours or it could be weeks. Here's the one that y'all uh, kind of new idea, this, this SR, siRNA. It's a small interfering RNAs. Um, basically what it is, is is where the mRNA itself binds onto itself. And when it binds onto itself, these slicing enzymes will come along and actually break down the mRNA. And the mRNA is broken down, proteins can't be made. Okay, so this is another one of those ways to actually uh, regulate which RNAs is, is broken down. I didn't show you this picture in the video, but basically this was what it is, is that it actually folds onto itself. It uses what's called a dicer enzyme, pretty cool little name for an enzyme. It's like, it's like a, a Deadpool there. And so they come along and actually slice up the mRNA itself. What's up? No, actually, it slices up before it even it is even um, even read. So it's it's made it and like oh wait, it wouldn't actually need that protein. It can do something like this: sends the dicer enzyme, finds the siRNA, and actually breaks it apart, either before or after it's being read. Um, it it it's basically degraded and it's, the nucleotides are being reused. Themselves. So the protein isn't, either the protein isn't on, or it isn't uh, being used, and so that essentially is what turns off the gene. So this could also be a disease issue. Let's say that you, this might be the reason why you are diabetic. Your insulin gene is working just fine. You're producing plenty of insulin. But the problem is, is that you're producing plenty of mRNA to eventually make insulin, but the mRNA never gets there. Because your dicer enzyme, for some reason, is basically seeing those is double stranding and is coming along and breaking out the mRNA and the mRNA never makes it to the ribosome to make the enzyme insulin. And so your insulin genes are fine. You, you don't need gene therapy. What you need is something that controls that dicer enzyme, controls, it, controls this siRNA uh, production. So even though your gene is on, it's, it's, it's more or less off. Another way is, is control of translation. And basically, if, there's, there's a lot here, right? There's one through seven, and I was really trying to figure out like a way to like turn into a song or something like that. So if anyone can do that, more more power to you because that's awesome. I was trying to figure out like a way to like make it into like a, a like seven parts of this, and it's like seven parts of. I can't figure it out. But here's the easiest way to remember this: think of DNA to proteins. What are all the steps I have to go from DNA to proteins? That whole central dogma: DNA to RNA, RNA to proteins. Think about all the steps I have to go through. Where does the DNA have to do? Where, where does it have to go? What has to happen to it? 
And if you can think about those steps, think about all the places that could screw up, basically. Okay? The DNA could be folded wrong. The DNA could be packaged wrong. The mRNA could be read wrong. The mRNA could never actually make it out of the, out of the nucleus. The mRNA could never actually make it to the ribosome because it's been cut up. The ribosome could be folded wrong. The ribosome could be blocked. The mRNA could go into the ribosome, but the tRNA was then not allowed to be locked into it. The tRNA, you know, there's all these different steps. And so every single one of those different steps is a way that we can control the genes. And it's a way that your cells control the genes. So if you go back and look at each of these seven steps, these seven steps, if you just go and go back to chapter 14, go very, or sorry, chapter 15, and go to the very basic gene expression, and say, okay, take that gene expression picture, and then go through and say, okay, here could be a, 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 here could be a way we could regulate. Here's a way to regulate. And your cell regulates right there. So if, if, you, if you break it down to the basic level, and then kind of go up from there, then all of a sudden those, these seven ideas will become much easier to you. Okay? So if, if it helps, take, take, those, take the steps, line them up in a very, you know, multiple steps instead of three steps, oh, transcription, translation, protein synthesis. Yay. No. Break it into multiple steps. What happens first? What happens next? You know, break it into those 12 steps. Put those on index cards and then lay those out. And then grab another set of these seven and say, okay, that goes there, that goes there, that goes there. We're going to change this. We're going to change the protein. We're going to change the, um, the mRNA. We're going to change the ability to leave. And that's, that's the, what's going on here. Um, the other one is this death tag, which is a, it's a way, this ubiquitin is basically a tag. And the ubiquitin is going to be looked for by what's called a proteasome. And the proteasome is basically like a kind of a chamber. That protein will bring it in and break that protein down. Either because you don't need the protein anymore, um, because there's some kind of malfunction. Mal, uh, um, let me show you this. cell can get rid of abnormal or damaged proteins and limit the lifetime of functional protein by means of selective regulation. <coughs> the cell marks the protein for destruction by attaching small ubiquitin proteins. Giant protein complexes called proteasomes recognize ubiquitin and break down the tag protein. Okay. So, each of, those, each of those reasons or each of those ways, you know, the, the, the protein has been phosphorylated or the protein has been broken down or something that's not right with the protein, it's going to be tagged with this ubiquitin. This ubiquitin is then going to go into those proteasomes. Okay? And this is actually pretty new. This is actually like a Nobel, I think this is a Nobel Prize was granted because of this study right here, this idea of death tags. Okay? Um, so these are the guys actually would, that would figure it out. Um, New as in 2004. So it's, you know, it's 10 years ago, but it's pretty new. I don't know. To me, when I was in high school, when I was in college, like, when I graduated high school, this wasn't, no one knew this. And I'm not that old, I guess. Um, so it's new to me. So. This is just kind of showing you how it's broken down. Um, the proteasome is a, is a degrading machine. It actually breaks it down into to seven to nine amino acid fragments. Those seven and nine amino acid fragments can later on be broken down further, um, and then those amino acids can then be brought back as with the tRNA to form a new protein. So there's those seven, and this is what I'm talking about. If you take every single one of these steps, okay, every single one of these steps of, of taking and transcription, and then from transcription to translation, and then from, or translation, and then from translation into protein, uh, the actual protein forming, if you take each of those steps and break it down into instead of three steps, you break it down into six steps. Okay? Then you say, okay, well, if we break it down into six steps, you know, what's going to affect it here? What's going to affect it going out? Because remember, it's got to travel each time. And when it travels each time, something's going to happen to it. Something possibly could happen to it. And at that point is when we say the gene is off. Even though the gene is still on, you know, up here, yeah, sure, the gene can be turned off. You know, we, 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 um, we methylate it or we bind it tightly or something like that. But if the gene is on, 
and something happens down here and we broke, break down that mRNA, officially the gene is off at that time.